What is up, More Church? How y'all doing today? So good, right? Okay, remind me, let me see, because I was backstage. How many of you were able to be at SummerSlam Friday night? Yes! Y'all, it was an incredible time, an incredible night. And so if you were here, then you know that it's okay that the curtain is closed right now. If you weren't here, let me assure you, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Everything's going to be okay. I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to get to share with you today. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Whitney. I get to be the executive pastor here at Moore Church. My husband and I and my whole family, we've been a part and serving here for a long time, and we love this house. Last week, we were out on vacation. We went on a cruise. We took some time together to recharge and reconnect. The best part about a cruise is I did not let my family buy the Wi-Fi package. And so that meant all they had was to talk to each other. It was wonderful and incredible and so much fun. I got this crazy braid thing because my daughter asked me to. And when you have a teenage daughter and she actually asks you to do something with her, you're like, yes, I will do it. Absolutely. I'll look ridiculous. It doesn't matter. I love it. It's so much fun. And y'all, the truth is the best part about vacation is we actually escaped the heat of Texas. I can't believe that we went on a cruise and it actually was more of a relief in the weather than it is here in the midst of the 187,000 degree heat. But I'm so glad to be back in the house today. We got to be apart on Friday night as we uh, had our SummerSlam time together. And if you were here, you know that it was a little bit different than normal. It wasn't quite the same. It was only one night rather than three. Typically we have a three week revival at the end of the summer, but due to all of the changes this year uh, that happened this summer, being here at the center and different things, that was the opportunity that we got to have to meet uh, here last Friday night together. And it was an incredible time. You know, we still had incredible, powerful worship, even though the night was different than we've had before, right? It was so incredibly good. We had an opportunity uh, to, like I think Bailey mentioned, to honor and bless someone in our house, to show and celebrate the generosity of this house, the generosity of you who say, hey, I'm gonna be faithful to give to God what is his, and then we're able to take care of each other. We had an incredible time. And Pastor Trustin did what he always does. He listened to God, he was obedient, and he shared a word for us that was for him and for us. He took the time to be vulnerable and transparent, and that's what I love about our pastor, it's who he is, and I'm grateful that we're growing together in a house, growing on our journey with Jesus. And so he shared with us, if you weren't here, don't worry. Today is still gonna make a whole lot of sense to you. If you weren't here though, I would encourage you to go back and watch it, go back and experience it, go back and really soak it in. But Pastor Trustin took us on a journey. He talked to us about uh, this, the story of the song, It Is Well that Horatio Spafford, a Chicago businessman, wrote this song right in the midst of his grief and pain and heartache after losing his four daughters in a, a boat accident in, uh, on a cruise, actually, as they were headed to vacation. He penned the words, it is well with my soul. And as he left his home to go to meet his wife, the only survivor of his family in that, in that tragedy, he wrote a letter to his friend and said, there is just one thing that has become clear to me. I must not lose faith. You know, we talked on Friday night about the ways of disappointment in our life, that they try to cause us to lose our it is well, that it is an attempt of the enemy to get us to lose faith, to, to really, to, to steal our faith. You know, Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about we do, what we don't yet see. And the waves, they shake our confidence. They, they, they shake the assurance and the firm foundation that we have and, and we start to lose sight of what we know to be true and what we do believe, but because we can't see it, we start to get a little bit rocky. The waves shake us around and rattle us and, and it can be really hard to move forward. And so, you know, I believe that over the last two years, as we faced all kinds of things in our world, in our country, uh, everywhere around us, 
we've all felt a little bit shaken. And Pastor Trussell was transparent about some of his own waves that he's walked through. And, uh, you know, here in the church, as we've kind of walked through some of those together, in fact, Pastor Rachel, a few months ago, made a bracelet for me that says, do not be shaken. And I've worn it every single day since because it's a reminder that we have a firm foundation in Jesus. And we don't have to be shaken no matter what the wind and the waves bring, that we can be firm and and know that he is with us and he is good. And and we can go all the way up into the more that he has for us. That there's a rhythm of relationship with Jesus that he wants to establish. And we've been learning about it all summer long. But I felt like it wasn't right to just jump back into the Sermon on the Mount today, but that we actually had some more things to talk about from Friday night in order to kind of put a bow on it and move forward into uh, the next season of our church. You know, we've been learning and growing together. We've been understanding what it is to move all the way up to be in relationship with Jesus. And that's exactly what we talked about on Friday night as pastor told us, we need to learn to abide, to abide with him. John 15, four says, abide in me and I in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. You know, here we all want to produce fruit. We want to produce goodness out of what God is doing in our lives. We hope that actually our relationship with him will turn us uh, into better people, people who are more like him, following the example of Jesus all year long. We've been in the year of Jesus, learning and, and, and growing by his examples, by his teachings, understanding the character of God. And, and therefore, the more we abide with him, the more we can become like him. The, the more the moments that we feel shaken and rocky, the, the, the less they, they actually rock us on the inside and on the outside. And so as we talked about abide, I felt like it was important to continue that conversation, to actually say, what does it actually mean to abide? Let's take a look at it. The word abide, it's kind of a weird word, right? In fact, growing up in church, I would hear the word abide and I would be like, that is one of those like formal, fancy, older language words, right? That's for the ladies at the knitting like Bible study, right? That they meet in the gymnasium, you know, those, that group, right? That they're abiding together. And that just felt boring and kind of lame. And like, I don't really want to do that. Like I got a fun life and fun stuff to do, abide, what am I gonna do? But we have to take the time to really learn and understand what it means. It's hard, it's hard to abide when I don't actually get it, but it means simply to rest, to reside, to connect and to receive. And I think when we look at it, it looks really peaceful and it looks really wonderful and I really do wanna do that, right? But there's lots of reasons why we don't. Why don't we abide? And I think some of it really is because we fully don't understand what it means. We don't really get what it looks like. But to abide with God, to abide with Jesus is simply to hang out with him, to be uh, connected to him in all seasons and all moments of life. You know, our friends, Trustin and Rachel, our pastors, uh, they've been Aaron and I's best friends for, well, uh, well over a decade now. And we have a phrase we say all the time to each other, ride or die. And like, it's silly. And like on the internet, you see the memes that say, where are we going? Do we have to die, right? And like, what does ride or die really mean? Well, the truth is it just means wherever you are, that's where I am. Wherever you're going, that's where I'm going. If they're mad at you, they're mad at me. If they're rude to you, they're, they're rude to me. If, I gotta, if you're fighting them, I'm fighting them, right? If you're invited to the party, hey, just so y'all know, if you invite us to a party, you invited them to a party. And if you invited them to a party, You invited us to a party, we're ride or die. That's just the way it works. And the longer we've lived life together, the more we've known and seen that no matter the circumstances, even when it's really painful, we're in it together. And even when it's really fun, we're in it together. And the truth is abiding with God is exactly the same thing. Abiding with God is a real ride or die relationship saying, hey God, wherever we're going, you're going with me and I'm going with you. 
That if I walk into that doctor's appointment and I am scared to death about what the doctor is actually gonna say, the thing that can bring me peace in the moment is that you're in the room with me. The fact of the matter is no matter what I'm walking into, when I go into that meeting that my boss called just between me and him, and I'm like, oh no, I know I'm in trouble. I actually know though that you are on my side, that you are right next to me and you're with me in the midst of that meeting. Even when the job isn't what we expected and we have to start all over again, God, you're right there with me. Even when the people I loved and trusted and and really put my heart and soul into, even when they leave me, you don't leave me because you're right by my side. But it does also mean that when we do the things that we know we shouldn't do, he's right by our side too. That when we go to the party, we make the decision again that we said we wouldn't make for the 86th time, he's standing right there too. And that's the part we don't really like to talk about. In fact, we like to be like, hey God, you just, you just stay right there. I'll be right back. You just hang out here. Uh, I'll be right back. And that's not really abiding. It's like more like abusing grace, but like that's a whole nother conversation, uh, a whole nother sermon and I ain't got time for it. But we have to learn that when we abide with God, we're in relationship with him, no matter what the circumstances around us, he's with me, I'm with him, we're in this together. But we still struggle, don't we, to abide because it sounds pretty great to be ride or die best friends with Jesus, but we still struggle to abide. And pastor taught us on Friday such a beautiful illustration of the different rooms that we find ourselves in sometimes and the reason why our it as well starts to dissipate, our our faith starts to be a little bit shaken. We, We find ourselves avoiding dealing with the circumstances. We can deny or numb or hide, we pretend. We, 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 we wanna distract ourselves, right? And so we sit and we watch TV, we, we binge watch on Netflix, uh, all these old shows that like are from years ago and then all the ones that are current. We have so many things that we've gotta keep up with and put in our next up queue, right? And, and we're just it's, just, it's just TV, I'm just watching, I'm just keep, but it's, we're using it to, to hide, to numb. We're playing video games all the time, not because video games are fun and not because we wanna be connected with our friends, but because that's the one place where we feel like a winner. And so we can sit there and we numb our life and we spend so much time. And and he went a little at the dudes on Friday. And so I just gotta go a little bit at us today because the truth is, ladies, we do the same thing. Due to circumstances, the Holy Spirit's leading. A few weeks ago, I decided I needed to get off social media for a couple of weeks. And at the time I thought, that actually is like silly, but okay, a few people in my life have said God spoke it, so I'll do it, like whatever. It's not that big deal, I don't have an issue with it. And I really realized how much time I've wasted, not just time in my day, but time in my seasons because I'm able to think that this is connection with people. And then when I think about the last time I actually took someone to coffee or I actually looked face to face with another friend and said, how are you? Let me tell you how I am. It's actually been a really long time. We, we, we cover with buying new clothes at the store. We, we cover with buying new shoes, buying all kinds of things to help us pretend that everything is good that everything is fine, that, that, that we're, we're great, it's golden. But the truth is, the more we avoid, we start avoiding not just our life, but the people in our life. And God created us for deep connection and relationship, not to live life alone in isolation, but the enemy does a really tricky thing in pulling us back and making us avoid. And then, and then we end up not being connected to anyone and feeling all alone in our struggle and not even abide, uh, abiding with God. Or we become afraid, we get so worried and stressed, we, we work ourselves to death, we, we take the time, whoop, yep. Yeah. Look, there's the chair. We take the time uh, to work so much because we're trying to actually keep ourselves from the fear that we have. 
We're worried and stressed and fighting. We're restless because we just can't be settled in the circumstances of our life. We give so much time and energy to things that don't matter instead of to the one who can take care of all of our matters. We, 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 we avoid people but then in our afraid room, what we do is we're so busy doing all the things that the people right in front of us, we don't actually see them. And we're not actually paying attention. We're not actually listening. And pretty soon your kid that was six is now 16. And you're like, where did the time go? And it went right here to your work. It went right here to, to the things that you needed to provide for. And all of a sudden we, we, we just, we realize that we have lost or it is well because it's been so long since we abided. We, we try really hard. We get here, we come over here, or we come to a SummerSlam moment and we're like, God, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna put the time on the clock. I'm gonna put the, the space in my day, in my week. I'm gonna make sure that I actually spend time with you. But the truth is, if we don't deal with the root of the fruit of these things, then we never actually get to a place of abiding. Because what I haven't fully let myself understand is that the reason I think I need all of these clothes and all of these shoes and all of these perfect pictures on Instagram is because I've worked really hard to make sure my family is not like the family I grew up in. And so I sure don't want anybody to ever think it's as chaotic as that. And so I'm gonna take a picture and I'm gonna post it and don't talk about it, don't, don't do, if you don't smile, you don't eat. And so our vacation is actually spent taking pictures over and over to prove to invisible people that my family is different. I've got it all put together. I, I'm avoiding the conversations I need to have because when I was eight, life was impossible and I had to check out just to survive. And now I'm 38 and I'm still checking out of life because I've convinced myself that the problems of today are as big as the problems that I had when I was eight. And instead of dealing with what happened then, I'm just checking out in my life right now. I have not really fully grasped the unworthiness that I felt growing up. That, that they always had other things to buy, other things to spend their money on, and really there wasn't enough money to go around. And so I go to the store and I buy my 12th pair of white shoes. I ain't calling you out, Sid, it's me. These are my shoes, they're not yours. All of these are mine, it's cool. But I haven't really let myself admit that that's what I'm using to numb the feeling of unworthiness inside my heart. And until we're willing to not just say, oh, this is the room I sit in, but why is this the room I sit in? We're never gonna fully be able to heal and become all that God wants us to be. And so I know many of you abided Friday night and you might've even abided last year at SummerSlam on the last night when we took time to get away with God, but maybe those are the only two times you've abided in the last year and a half. But let's ask ourselves why? Why do we so quickly go from room to room? Why do we so quickly end up back in the place where we know that we don't wanna be, but we end up being there. The Apostle Paul said it in the Bible, I know the things I ought to do, but I don't do them. And I, I, I know the things I don't want to do, and yet I still do them. And, and yet this is just a human nature situation. You're not a loser. You're not a weirdo. You're just a person. And so instead, what we have to do is go, why have I filled my day planner full of things? Why have I actually spaced every moment of my life full of things? Because when I was 16, they never invited me. But now if I'm the life of the party, then everyone will want to come to my party. And then I will always be the one inviting and I can decide. And if they're on my list, they're not getting invited. But I keep it busy and I keep it hype and energetic and exciting. And I work hard. I work harder than anybody. And y'all be no, y'all know, I'm talking to myself. I work harder than anybody because I never had enough. So I buy the things to prove 
that I have enough, but then I work hard because if I need it, if I want it, I could trust God, but I think I'll take care of it myself. Because growing up, there were plenty of times when I didn't feel like anybody saw me or anybody took care of me. And so if I want to be taken care of, I'll just take care of myself. I'll make sure that I work and I fight. Did you know there was one season of my life working in fragrance company where I worked for five different companies at one time and I would literally clock this hours to these hours and these hours to those hours and these hours because I was so convinced that if I'd let go of one of them, I might just lose it all. The poverty mindset in my mind and in my heart that if I didn't just say yes to every circumstance, then I might miss God. And the whole time he was just over here like, baby, I got way bigger plans for your life. If you just come and sit with me and talk to me, you wouldn't be running around foolish and crazy. You wouldn't be missing every soccer game of your kids because you would actually have time. But if you'd abide with me, you could actually understand it. And I felt so deep in my heart that we had to talk about the fact that this is not a money issue. It's not. It's a trusting that he is actually Jehovah Jireh, our provider. It's an it's a, it's a issue with understanding where the deep root of insecurity and fear comes from so that we can actually move forward because good grief, the amount of toilet paper I have in my home right now still is ridiculous because what if it's gone again? But I never lost it in the first place. I never ran out before when it wasn't even on the shelf because he provided then and it's silly and we laugh about toilet paper but we actually don't take the time to understand why we're doing the things we're doing and whoever you are whichever room you find yourself in the truth is just like me there's two sides to the coin and we can flip flop between the rooms and end up getting dizzy and crazy because we really are the same people I think that us hustlers like to shame the avoiders and call them things like lazy, but really we're just workaholics because we have the same struggle. And so we have to, instead of judging, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount that we're gonna preach today, but we'll get there eventually. Instead of judging them, we have to look inside ourselves and say, what am I doing? Oh, the enemy is trying to steal my faith. He's trying to steal my it as well, and I need to just learn to abide, but we don't. We don't do it so often. Why, why don't we abide? I know for me, and I think for a lot of us, we struggle to see him as father and not just the financier of our dreams. We shout, Jehovah Jireh, he's the God of more than enough. We say he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We believe he's for us. And so if he's for us, then who can be against us? And then we go into our abide with our own list of what we want. And then we give him five minutes and we get frustrated because we think, I've got the faith and I've done the preparation. So where in the world is the elevation I've been looking for? We get so mad because we, 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 we feel like we've done it all that we could do. And so now I brought it to you. Now, what are you gonna do with it? This is my struggle. This is what happens to me all the time. In our house, uh, we have two teenagers. They're grown, they're big kids. They know how to clean up after themselves. Doesn't mean they always do, but they know how. But uh, I have four adorable nieces and a nephew. They're adorable. They're gonna show you a picture, I think, of how adorable they are. Aren't they adorable? See, they're that adorable that they make you go, ah. Oh. But in our house, you know, everything's kind of just the way it is because everybody's cool and copacetic and grown enough to take care of things. But every now and then when my nieces and nephew visit, they live in Oklahoma and it's about a four hour drive. And when they're about an hour away from the house, everybody knows what's up. Everybody knows, go to your stations. 
find the perfect location, grab the breakable things and move them higher up on the shelf so that Ellie cannot touch it and Finley will not lose the, the why, what is it, the Wii, the, the Switch, Nintendo Switch remotes again for nine months like she did last time. We, we move the things and we put them higher up so that we uh, make sure that things are safe. But mostly I do it because I love them. I don't wanna make sure they're safe. Because if the snow globe drops and shatters on the floor, they might cut their feet. And so I, I move the things up higher because I'm hoping and praying that they will not get hurt. And sometimes I think we have to recognize that God has moved some things out of our reach right now because he knows we're just not ready. He knows that if he gave it to us right now, we'd actually hurt ourselves with it. A few months ago, I was praying and I was frustrated because there's some dreams in my heart, some things that God has told me that he's going to do and I believe he's gonna do it. And right before COVID, it felt like everything was falling into place and those things were starting to come to pass. And then this weird season happened for everyone, but somehow I've gotten offended that it's just me that he's forgotten. And I'm like, hey, do you not see? Uh, uh, What about all that you said? And clear as day in my heart, I felt him say, if I gave you those things today, would the way you're living your life and the pace that you're running your life in, would it actually sustain it for any longer than a week? You see, we have to understand that he's a good father. There is no way that Aaron Barth is not going to make sure that McKinley doesn't get the shoes she needs for back to school that she doesn't get to go on the choir trip to Disney World. And and that is as long as it depends on him that he can even take her to Harry Styles when he comes in concert because he knows the things that she desires and he wants to give good gifts to her. And he is just a man. Imagine the gifts that our father has for us with unlimited resources. If we just abide and allow him, he's like, hey, listen, I know you've done your preparation but I'm the one who prepares you for where you're going. I'm the one with the preparation for your elevation. I'm the one, if you'll sit with me and learn from me, then I'll make you ready. I'm just protecting you, baby. I know you're trying to make $200,000 a year, but you keep spending $60 a week at Starbucks. Some of y'all been to that new Dutch Brothers eight times in the last week. And he's like, if I give it to you, you will lose it all on coffee. It costs 10 cents to make at your house. And some of us older people, we laugh, but we're like, in our life, man, if I was in charge at work, I would do it my way and everything would be easier and everything would be better. Except you haven't turned in an expense report on time in the last six months and and you haven't been able to complete the tasks that your boss has given you. How can you be your own boss when you won't even do the tasks that your boss has assigned to you? How are you gonna figure out which tasks you need to do as the boss? God is like, I'm protecting you, baby. You're not ready yet. Abide with me just a little bit longer. Understand that I wanna be in relationship with you because I know you want that relationship of marriage. I know you want to have a happy life and you've been praying for a spouse, but if you'll come in relationship with me, I'll teach you how to get your emotions in check. If you'll be in relationship with me, I'll help you understand how to live a selfless life instead of the selfish life you've been living. If I brought them into your life right now, you chase them away in the first six months, but I want you to be in relationship with me. He's a good father. He's protecting us from ruining what we aren't ready for. But we don't, we don't see him as a father. We see him as a benefactor or like one of the sharks uh, in Shark Tank or like Marcus Lemonis on the prophet. Uh, So often I I come into God with my giant list of things and I'm like, okay, here's what I want you to see. Here's the work I've already done. Here's the comments uh, uh, that I've already been given about this. Uh, uh, like, Like this is my plan A. And then like, if you don't like that, then here's also plan B. And like, I could take this job, but then this side hustle would happen. And then uh, I, I definitely want this in, the, in my spouse. And then, and then I, I really, I really, I, I mean, I could deal with these things. Like I could deal with these things, but I hope that you'll give me those things. And like, you know, here's what Pastor Whitney told me and what my cousin told me and my three life group leaders told me and my dog's neighbor's sister, she told me. And so here's my options, what do you pick? 
what will you give me for 30% stake in my future? We come with our own expectation of what we want it to look like and how the end result should be. And we don't allow him in any of our rooms to say anything that contradicts anything of our comfort level. We second guess his direction if it's not in alignment with what we want or what we saw on that coolest like trending sermon clip that made us feel really good that we passed around to all our friends. And so if it contradicts with that, we're like, oh, that's not from the Lord. Okay, Michael Todd is not the Lord. Michael Todd is a man. And so the Lord wants to speak some things to you. I love Michael Todd. I'm just saying he is not Jesus. Jesus is Jesus. And, And we second guess things if it means that we have to let go of control. This is what I do all the time. That is not logical, God. Why would we make that decision when that is crazy? I, 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 I have words of faith. I, I don't want to walk in faith. <laughs> That's really hard. He's like, if you'll just abide. One of the verses God's brought to my heart over the last year is 1 John 3, 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be children of God. My kids have not done anything to earn my love, except be my kids. We don't have to do or be or present or prove. We just are his children and he loves us and it's great love and he lavishes it upon us. And, and I, I, we have to take the time to understand that if we really want all the more that God has for us, we have to be willing to actually abide. Okay, Pastor Whit, fine. How do we abide then? Well, on Friday night, you abided for several minutes if you were here. In a big room with great worship music playing all over, right? You had a pen and a journal in your hand. Everybody wrote something down. How were you and why were you able to abide on Friday night? When you haven't, and maybe since the last time you came to Summer Slam. Because you had a room and a time and a space and some supplies that were provided, the distractions, the kiddos were taken away, the atmosphere was set, the posture was prepared, you were able to abide and receive. And the truth is, what I know, talking to a few of you, is that you wrote down things that God's been trying to work with and deal with you on for a long time. But because we have not taken this time and created the space to sit and hear it, This is the first time he's getting to talk to us about it again. But yeah, there's just so many things. There's so many things. I can't put my phone down. My kids need me. Pastor said that on Sunday or on Friday and it hit me like a ton of bricks because I'm like, right, the staff needs me. I have to answer their questions. I was on a boat for a week. They didn't ever text me about nothing. They didn't need nothing. My kids, what if they're, what if they're, what if they need, what if, what if, what if they call? What if the nurse at school can't get a hold of me? What if they're stuck and the, and the bus gets a flat tire and they didn't make it home? And I was, when he said it, I was like, oh, because this uh, very vain thing that I've started doing over the last year, but saves me time, uh, is that I get my eyelashes lifted because, uh, yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's the thing I do and it's worked into my budget. Okay, so yeah, that's fine. Uh, and for 45 minutes, I lay on a bed And I text everyone in my life out for 45 minutes so that I can make my eyelashes be lifted so I don't have to curl them and have them fall out. But the God of the universe, I think I can't take 45 minutes to say, I'm out for 45 minutes and throw it in the drawer and actually listen to him and take the time with him. Y'all, we have to be willing to take the time and make the time to create the space. It does not have to be a cute corner in your house. It does not have to look all beautiful and white. You do not have to wear gray and white to match it so that you look good in the picture, right? It does not have to be like that. In my house, if I tried to spend time alone with God in my house, do you know how chaotic and crazy that would be? 
I got McKinley practicing like a new gyra or something. Her and Philip be making a mashup. I don't even know what's happening. She over there singing loud and crazy. I got Easton watching a loud video of how to do some new technical something graphic and video design thing. I got my husband, my sweet husband working for home half the, half the days of the week. And so he, he's like over there in the, in the game room. He took like some of the pictures off the wall to make like a white background behind him. He's got, uh, he, he's on a Zoom call with the FAA talking about like all the legal ramifications of situations and he's got like business on top and he's got like gym shorts and Crocs on bottom. That's a real picture I took one day in the middle of one of his Zoom calls because I was like, do you see yourself right now? You better put that picture back up on the wall too when you're done, sir. My house would be crazy if I tried to abide there. But we can find places and times and spaces that work out best for us. If you can hear from God in a giant auditorium, you can hear from God in your car alone before you go into work. If you can hear from God in this place, that is not, uh, uh, it's great in my estate, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, but it's not special or sacred or holy. If you can hear from God in this room, you can hear from God in uh, your office with the door closed on your bre lunch break. You, you can hear from God in whatever place that you can get away to pray and to be alone. But we have to make a plan. It doesn't even have to be an hour, y'all. It doesn't have to look the same every time. We just have to make a plan because if we fail to plan, we plan to fail. And that is a phrase that I love to say in life. And, and you're going, wait a minute, Pastor Witt, I thought it wasn't about work. I thought it wasn't about being afraid. No, it's not, but it's a decision. And we do have to make a plan and an execution for the decision to abide. Don't get it confused though. Abiding is a way of life. It is not a window on your calendar. It's the many moments of, ab of abiding that lead us to a lifestyle of abiding. Because if you can learn to abide in a moment, your emotions can abide in your family mess. If you can abide in a moment, your mind can abide in a tough meeting. If you can learn to abide in a moment, then your soul can abide in the middle of a meltdown. If you can learn to abide in a moment, your thoughts will abide even with whatever is happening on the news and social media. We have to move beyond playing the Christian character and checking the box and into the rhythm of relationship with Jesus to understand that it's about connecting to him. It's not a performance. It's not a checkbox, it's connection with Christ. John 15, five, the verse after John 15, four says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. It's consistent abiding. You feel like maybe you were making progress. This is what I felt like many times in my life. I was making progress and then what happened? Oh, I stopped abiding. My soul stopped abiding. Maybe I'm still actually sitting, doing the rote, actual, like uh, putting myself through the motions of my uh, Bible time and devotional time. And maybe I'm praying, but I'm not actually abiding. We have to take the time to understand it's about being connected to Jesus. These grapes right here did not grow by themselves. They grew being connected to the vine. And we bought these at the grocery store and I don't know all the rules and laws and I don't know how long it was on a truck and blah, blah, blah. But what I know is that there's already some that are like squishy and gross. Because the minute they got plucked from the vine, they actually started dying. And if we wanna keep growing into all the more that God has for us, we have to stay connected to the vine. It's not just one time at SummerSlam and then out again until the next time. It's not just one week, uh, one day a week on Sunday, but then not really any of the rest of the week until we come back here on Sunday again. Or maybe we go to life group in the middle of the week and so we got two times a week, we're doing it, woo woo. That is still not enough to keep us growing in our walk with Jesus. It's the rhythm of relationship we've been talking about. And you know, here at More Church, we're committed to being people who produce good fruit, not just good gifts. 
We spent an entire summer last summer talking about the fruits of the Spirit because we've all known Christians who walked in the gifts of the Spirit but didn't seem to have very much love or very much joy or very much goodness. And at More Church, we're committed to being people who have the fruits of the Spirit as well as the gifts of the Spirit. It's rhythm of relationship. It's why we've been talking about moving all the way up all summer in the Sermon on the Mount. It's why we're spending the entire year in the year of Jesus learning and growing from the examples of Him because we want to be more like Him, to be connected to the vine to say, what nutrients do you have for me so that I can be the most fruit producing believer that I can be? And that's the goal. First John 2, 6 says, whoever says he abides in Jesus ought to walk in the same way in, G- in which Jesus walked. It means you ought to follow the same examples. It's why we're learning again how to be in relationship with him, but what it looks like for us as Christ followers so that we are a good representation to, of him to the rest of the world, to the people we work with, to our family that is the family mess that I'm trying to abide in the moment, right? To, to the people and, and the circumstances around us that are actually melting down. But I know there's still lots of doubts and questions. Like, what if I didn't actually hear anything from God? What if I didn't actually have anything good to say to him when we abided Friday night? Can I tell you, it's not about answers. It's about abiding. It's not about results. It's about relationship. It's not perfectly formed words. It's not this perfect way of communicating. And then he always answers back. In fact, just this week, I called my husband and I just said, I gotta tell you what's happening. And that is not a new thing. It's a thing I do pretty consistently of like, hey, I just got a gripe to you. And I know there's nothing you can do about it. And I know there's nothing that's gonna change right now in this circumstance, but I need somebody to know. And so I'm calling you because you're my guy and I'm gonna let you know. And guess what? God's like, hey, you can do that to me too. You can actually talk to me in the same way. In fact, in this last season, when I've been trying to learn that he is my father, not just my financier, I've had to shift my verbiage. I've told some of you this before, that I had to, I've had to actually start my prayers saying, hey dad, because I gotta remember that he loves me and he cares to hear it. Sometimes I think we open our prayer with, oh gosh, I gotta get it all out really fast because he's really busy. And if I don't do it just right and all the things, he's not even gonna hear me. No, 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 he wants, the Bible says he turns his ear to us. He wants to hear your prayer. He wants to hear what's stressing you out. He wants to know what's going on and he's not even necessarily gonna answer it or fix it right this second. He just wants you to call on him. Just tell him what's up. What if, it, what if it doesn't make sense? Like what if I wrote something in the journal or what if like while I'm there with him, he spoke something to me and it didn't make sense? Hey, that's okay, that happens all the time. In my life, all the time. Uh, I grew up thinking I was not athletic. It's like a thing in my life, some of my junk that I've been working through. And, uh, and so I always say I'm not athletic. And we went uh, a few years ago to California with our friends, Trust and Rachel, and uh, we had the opportunity to paddleboard. And at first I was like, I don't even think I'm gonna do it. Cause like, guys, I'm not athletic, I can't do it. And Rachel is like my cheerleader, my champion of life. And she's like, who says you're not athletic? You're the only one saying you're athletic, get on the board, you're gonna do it. Okay, fine. So I did, and I found out I was actually great at paddleboarding. And then since then, anytime there's an opportunity to paddleboard, I am like, guys, I am the paddleboard queen. I'm the champ. I'm going to paddleboard. And they're all falling off the board. And I'm like, oh, must be so hard for you. (laughs) But it's just like this thing that I like to do. I don't know. And so we went to uh, Mexico last year. We get to go um, uh, often for uh, an event with missionaries where we get to meet them there and kind of hear what God's doing and then help figure out what what us as a church are gonna partner with them in the next year or so. And so we were there and the place we were staying had paddle boards outside. And so I told Aaron like, I'm pa- we know that I am paddleboarding because I am paddleboard champ. It's my one sport that I'm really good at. I might go in the Olympics for it. And so I'm out there. I know it's not a sport, but it is a sport. It's my sport, okay? And so I'm out there paddle boarding. And what I realized about why I love paddle boarding is because I can't have my phone. 
and I can't actually be near anyone. The first time I was all mad, like, why'd you pedal away from me? He's like, I'm just trying to stay on the board. Like, (laughs) you're just alone, you and God, and a vast ocean that I cannot actually like make any greater or grander than it is right there in that moment. And God is able to speak to me and download some things to me. And just this past December, he spoke some really clear stuff to me about, uh, trust your feet, Uh, really stay steady, be firm, ride the waves when they're coming. And I wrote it all down and I was like, what in the world is God talking to me about surfing for? Like, what does this even have anything to do with anything? But I had no idea about all the waves of disappointment that were gonna come in the next nine months. I had no idea of the things where I would need to learn to trust my own feet in the room, to stand firm on what he had told me, what I knew to be true, that I would need to stand firm in who he created me to be no matter what anybody else said. And I had to be willing to know and trust and see that I was just gonna ride these waves out, baby. Because it might be trying to steal my peace. It might be trying to steal my, it is well. It might be trying to steal my faith. But the truth is God is for me and he is with me. And the more I abide with him, the more I can trust and see. And so it might not make sense what you write down. And that's okay. It might not make sense, make sense what he speaks to you. Guess what? It's just for you. It's not for anybody else. You don't gotta go share all the things that he's speaking to you in your abide. You don't gotta go tell everybody what he's telling you. You don't gotta go process it with all your friends. Some things are good for that. Some things you need to do that. But, but some things are just for you and God as you abide. Yeah. Well, what if it feels like I'm just wasting my time? Listen, there's always gonna be things that are gonna pull us back. And I guarantee you there are people right now in this room who wrote a bunch of stuff down on Friday and were like, I gotta deal with those, I'm gonna deal with those because I had this moment and this feeling and this emotion. And then you went home and by Saturday afternoon, you're like, I actually am fine. I don't even know what that was about. Pastor Trustin up there getting me all emotional. He's such a good communicator. That's all it was. was, I was just feeling the moment, that's all it was. No, God is like, I have been trying to talk to you about this for a long time. Would you abide with me and listen? It's going to take time. Digging through the onion layers of our life takes time. We have to be willing to abide, go to counseling, have actual accountability in our life, like all of these things, but it's gonna take some time and it's not a waste. Because when we actually learn to abide here, And here, gas can cost $800 and eggs can be $25 a carton and I'm still gonna abide. My marriage is maybe can still be not what I'm hoping it can be. Some of you have spouses you're still praying and believing for. And guess what? The ones of you who have been able to abide, you're the one standing firm and trusting and knowing that he's gonna do it even when you have not yet seen a budge or an inch that he will. And guess what? He will. He's been working even when we don't see it, even when we don't understand. You can still be struggling with that child that you are like, they are so rebellious, they're never gonna get it. You can keep abiding. Just keep abiding, keep abiding, keep abiding, knowing that even when you pray the prayer a hundred times, he's with you, he's for you, he hears you, he sees you. Just abide. But what if I, what if I can't figure it out? What if, I, what if I can't? Like, what if I actually like don't know Uh, And and what if I'm just like struggling still and and I don't know if I avoid or if I'm afraid and I don't really know why I do or if I do and I, I, that is why God put us in relationship with each other. That is why God created prayer partners in church, like spiritual men and women who are in relationship with us so that we can go and say, can you help me process this? I I make this decision over and over again and I don't know why and I really don't want to because it makes my Thursday night and my Friday night and my Saturday night really lame and and I want to stop but I just can't figure it out. Did you know that in this house, this is not a place of judgment. This is a place of healing. This is a place of peace. The body of Christ, God created us to help each other in relationship, to help us on the journey together. And so as we abide with him, then we can abide with each other and say, hey, let's work out some of these things together. 